And no exaggeration, the number one scholar on ancient African history in the world today. Notice, I did not say the UK. I did not say Europe. I said the world today. Planet Earth, the universe, inter, outer, 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 national. This is a real bad man when it comes to scholarship. He is the author of the seminal works when we ruled the number one textbook on black african history in today's world kings and queens he is a black studies teacher and he goes by the name of the black history man kings and queens put your hands together and show some love for the and Robin Walker! All right, so why are we here? Who's here for some powerful black history information? Who's here for that? Who's here to learn about the hidden sciences of what we can learn from ancient Egypt? Who's here for that? Who's here because it's Saturday afternoon and you have nothing better to do, <laughs> no place else to be? Okay. All right. Now, I have to respect the fact that you have entrusted me with your education for the next one hour. And hopefully I'm not going to waste your time. Hopefully I'm going to give you value for your hour. All right. Special up the Hidden Science Academy. I also have to big up the scientist, Mr. Leon Marshall. Um, so some people are wondering, who is this Robin Walker geezer? So thorough. Get Robin Walker's books. Amen. So the books that I have here, <laughs> there's a book called Black History Matters. Now, if you've never seen this book, this book is making history. This is the first time that anyone's ever written a children's book that is proper, hardcore, Afrocentric, that is taking the story from Kemet to the ancient African civilizations, to slave trade and anti-slavery resistance, to um, the colonization period and the pan-African resistance, to um, the African-American uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and African-American resistance, and then finally 1948 and black British resistance in one book. So if you want this, there are copies available. Also, <laughs> The book on which today's session is based is called Blacks and Religion, Volume 1. I don't know if you can see the third point, but the third point says, Understanding the Book of the Dead. And that's what I'm going to be speaking on today. And then there's a book generally on ancient Egyptian sciences, if that interests you. All right, let's get straight into it. Make the word of Osiris truth against his enemies. Raise up the jet which image the resurrection of the gods. Let the mummy type of the eternal be once more mainstay and divine support of all. In other words, your duty is to make the word of Osiris truth against his enemies. And if you do that, you are doing what chapter 18 of the Book of the Dead says you should be doing. All right, back in the day, I came across a mention of the Book of the Dead, particularly the Papyrus of Arnie version of it, uh, in the writings of our dearly beloved elder scholar, Professor Yusuf Ben Yochanan. And Dr. Ben made the extravagant claim, and I'm going to read exactly what he said. The gods, or Orishas, of the Yoruba religion of West Africa, headed by the supreme being, Oludamare, aided by his ancestral spirits, and of course, Vodun, the supreme being, or god of the voodoo religion, also teach the same truth as do the gods, Jehovah of the Hebrews, Jesus Christ of Nazareth of the Christians, and Allah of the Muslims' religion. Yet metaphysics and philosophy have been taught in a manner suggestive of the non-existence in the two African religions of West Africa mentioned above, but not of the other three they have labelled Western religions, forgetting the fact that the fundamental basis of all three, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, originated at the same source the other two also took root. Such, however, being typical of professors who are oriented 
to the type of Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Judeo-Christian, Greek-centric racism and religious bigotry that permeated Western education. Nevertheless, they cannot escape history. Negative confessions and other major works of the ancient indigenous, indigenous Africans, Africans constantly, constantly remain, remain as the ghosts that haunt them. Now, when I read that, my response was, wow. So you know what I did? I bought the Papyrus of Ani. I tried to read it and was thoroughly, what do you think the next word is? Thoroughly dismayed. Thoroughly dismayed. I thought the book was African mumbo jumbo. All right, let's get um, so a, a straw poll in the room. Who's tried to read the Papyrus of Ani? Who's tried to read it? All right, what do you all think? Can't make sense of it. So you think it's mumbo jumbo as well? Yeah. Couldn't make head nor tail of it, but it's not mumbo jumbo. Who else tried to read it? Anybody? Okay, what did you think of it? Didn't understand it at all. And guess what? Neither did I. I thought this was, it's like, what the hell is Professor Ben Yokinen talking about? So that was still my view until I went to visit the British Museum pre-exhibition, which took place in 2010. And the pre-exhibition was called Ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, Journey Through the Afterlife. I then found out that Dr. Ben was absolutely correct. Absolutely correct on the money. So what is the true importance of the Book of the Dead? There's um, a Scottish scholar, Major General J.G.R. Forlong, who wrote a book in 1883, and this is what he says. It was undoubtedly Cushites <clears throat> who rendered possible the Aryan advance, who played the part of civilizing Rome thousands of years before Roma's birth. It was their vast mythology and strange legends that passed, as Lord Bacon wrote, like light air into the flutes of Grecians, there to be modulated as best suited Grecian fancies. Indeed, it is manifest from many old writings that it was their tales, myths, traditions and histories that lay at the base of the Western world's thought and legendary lore. These so impressed all subsequent races and entered so deeply and minutely into all Aryan mythologies that many writers now think Aryans can only claim to have added to the superstructure and complexion of European myth, excuse me, of Ethiopian myths and mythical history. What about that for a big claim? And guess what? Guess what? Guess what? <laughs> He was right. <laughs> I'm going to prove this completely correct. Does that make sense? We're with that? All right, let's do it. About this presentation, I'm going to address the following themes. Egyptian concepts of life, spirituality and death. Using the Book of the Dead in the Duat or the Mysteries of Menta and in the Hall of the Two Ma'ats. All right, we're with that? Everyone happy? That's the content you're going to get. Let's get straight to it. What was the Book of the Dead? It's a papyrus roll, and the papyrus roll is very, very long. Some of them can be as long as 40 meters in length. And on the backs of these rolls was three words, Peret M. Heru, which means coming forth by day. So some people say we shouldn't even be calling it the Book of the Dead. Some people say we should be calling it by the African name, coming forth by day. Now, keeping it real, death is a business. And what would happen is, is the names and titles of the owner were often written in a different hand to the scribe who wrote or copied the body of the text. And this suggests that the papyrus rolls were pre-produced in workshops awaiting orders. And then when you kept these in some kind of archival system, once they were bought, the owner's name was put on it. And that's why the version we have that survived intact, Papyrus of Ani. In other words, Ani's copy of the Book of the Dead. All right, so how do we interpret this? Can you see we've got Ani and Tutu, husband and wife? And can you see that Ani's heart is, a, is on one pan of a scales? 
and on the other side you've got the feather of Ma'at. And then you have Tehuti, has got everything written down about Ani's life. And so he's going to be judged against what's in his life. And then what happens is, is behind Tehuti is the Lady of Amit. She's also known as the devourer of the unjustified. In other words, you don't want that, that beast to be eating up your heart. Does that make sense? So you've got to make sure your heart is so light that it balances the feather of Ma'at. Does that make sense? So that means you can't have a guilty heart. Then we have here Horus taking Ani by the hand. Horus is taking Ani by the hand to meet his father. Does that make sense? And his father is on the throne and his father has the shepherd's crook that tells you he is the shepherd. He has the Jed symbol, which is the symbol of death and resurrection. And he has the flail that tells you he is the king. Why is Ani taking, uh, why is Horus taking Ani to meet his father? Because nobody can get to the father unless they get there through the son. Does that make sense? And then we also have here, sitting up in judgment, can you see you've got one, two people there, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve people sitting up in judgment. Is anyone think, finding this in any way significant? All right, so basically, when we're dealing then with the importance of the Book of the Dead, it's of major, major importance. All right, the first theme I want to get with is Egyptian concepts of life, spirituality, and death. What are the elements that make up a human being? The ancient Egyptians believed that human beings were made up of a composite of elements called keperu. There's the physical body, that's one element. There's the heart, which is probably the most important, and the heart is called the ab. Then you have the name, also known as the ren. You have the shadow, and then you have spirit aspects, the ka and the ba. There's probably many, many more, but those are the ones I want to talk about in this session. Now, what was the ka? The ka was the life force passed on through generations from parent to child, to the next generation, to the next generation. And it was represented in art as an exact copy of the individual. After death, it remained at the tomb and was nourished by food offerings from the living. What was the bar? There's the bar depicted, and it represents the soul. And it represented the personality of the individual and remained with them during life. It was depicted as a human-headed bird. But here's the interesting thing. It could leave the mummified body by day and be reunited with it each night. Get it? Coming forth by day. Rejoining each night. Now which 19th century story did they rip that off and then reverse it? Which one? Thank you. Count Dracula. So can you see then that the Dracula story is that turned around? Does that make sense? Because Dracula comes alive at night and has to disappear just as the sun comes up. Does that make sense? So you thought then that when it came to Dracula, Europeans came up with a new 19th century story. No, all they did was they teeth one of your stories and just reinverted it. That's all they did. Do you get that? Now, what are the elements that make up a human being? French philosopher René Descartes suggested a human being is made up of two things, a mind and a body. The mind represents the metaphysical element, the body represents the physical element. Does that make sense? And when Descartes said that a human being is made up of a physical and a metaphysical element, everyone said, boy, that's deep, bruv. Here's the thing. The ancient Egyptians beat him to it and came with something far more sophisticated. The ancient Egyptians believed that a human being is made up of so many elements Naim Akbar says we can call it the Nile Valley origins of the science of the mind. That is how sophisticated the ancient Egyptian perspective was. 
Now, we don't know exactly what the ancient Egyptian concepts mean because we're translating stuff from languages 2,000 to 7,000 years old into modern English. Does that make sense? But we can certainly agree that a human being is made up of separate elements such as, according to E.A. Wallace Budge, the cat, the physical body, the sa, the spiritual body, the ba, the soul, the ka, the double, the ak, the spiritual intelligence as a celestial being, the ab, the heart, the shekem, the power, the kaibit, the shadow, and the ren, the name. So what? According to Nigerian philosopher Chukunyeri Kamalu, in African civilizations, individuals are viewed as clusters of selves. And when these different entities are organized, they form a singular entity known as a person. When that unity breaks down, we no longer have a balanced and centered person. Do you understand that so far? Are we sure? Because I'm going to ask you a question. If you understand that, what happens when this unity breaks down? What do we have instead? What type of disease? Mental illness. Are we understanding this? So can you see then that your ancient African ancestors had worked out a theory of mental well-being and mental illness? And if that's true, this has implications for the understanding and treating of mental illness. Does that make sense? And if that's true, this raises the possibility of putting spirituality onto a scientific context doesn't it? Now isn't that a heavy concept? Aren't you glad you're here? All right, so what happens to an individual at death? Once dead, these aspects of the self became divided and they can only be united again after the correct rituals and spells had been undergone. Mummification transformed the dead physically and ritual and magical processes were believed to transform the dead spiritually. They became an ak, which means a transfigured spirit, or an aku, which is plural, transfigured spirits, or the blessed dead. And your aim would be part to become part of the aku. The corpse would be preserved, placed in the tomb, and its car was supplied with food and supplies. Once transformed into an ak, the dead would be assimilated to specific deities connected with creation and rebirth. So who are these specific deities? Who's this? Can you see that? The, 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 the coiled serpent on the top? Does that make sense? With the red sun disk? That's Ra. He travelled across the sun. Excuse me, he was associated with the sun and travelled across the sky, bringing life to the inhabitants of earth. Or this is what was believed. At sunset, he symbolically died and journeyed through the netherworld to re-emerge in the east at dawn, representing rebirth. The Egyptians believed they might participate in this endless cycle of recurring life. Another one of these deities. Does anyone know who this is? No one knows? That's Osiris, yes? Now, Osiris is always shown as jet black. Now, what about that for a powerful image of the deity? Jet black. And can you see that he's got the shepherd's crook in his hand? That tells you he is the shepherd. He's got the flail in his hand. That tells you he is the king. And can you see that that headgear he's wearing has been pilfered by the Pope? It's the same headgear. Yes? Just saying. Now, he ruled as king, says the mythology, but was treacherously murdered by Set, his evil brother who took his place. Isis then had him mummified and resurrected to life. His son, Horus, battled Set to avenge Osiris, and Osiris became the eternal ruler in the realm of the dead. And the Egyptians believed that they may have their life renewed, just as Osiris had. Now, what did Osiris mean to the dead body? Mummification transformed the dead body into an eternal image called the Sa. The Sa form assimilated the deceased to Osiris. Can you see that's the Wakanda forever? Yeah? 
and the bandages were tied tight to preserve the corpse and restrict movement. The pyramid texts call on the dead pharaoh to loosen and throw off his confining bandages. So can you see, you've got the pharaoh in this Wakanda forender, forever. He's tied tightly and the pyramid texts tell him, loosen and throw off his confining bandages. For those of us brought up with a particular religion, isn't that what was said to have happened to the founder of our religion? Yes? Isn't that what he was supposed to have done? Unfortunately, the Egyptians had beaten us to it by X amount of thousands of years. All right, now, what does this tell us? Professor John Taylor says, As early as the Old Kingdom, passages in the pyramid texts assure the dead king that he will loosen his bandages and throw them off. In keeping with this concept, the dead enjoyed the afterlife are depicted not as mummies, but as people in daily dress and having full command of their faculties. Isn't that a powerful idea? Yes? So can you see then that what a lot of us believe as Western Christianity is coming straight out of that stuff? Now, what is ancestralism? My tutor, the very great Dr. Femi Biko, he calls all traditional African religions ancestralists. Professor Taylor, who was the curator of the exhibition Book of the Dead Journey into the Afterlife, this is what he says. One of the most striking differences between ancient Egyptian religion and modern monotheistic religions is in their attitudes towards the dead. According to the modern view, contact with the dead is usually regarded as taboo. To the ancient Egyptians, it was an accepted part of the world. Family ties remained active. Indeed, a man depended on his relatives to arrange his burial and to support his spirit via the mortuary cult, visiting the tomb periodically to make offerings. The nature of the treatment of the dead by the living could have serious consequences, for the dead could both help the living and cause them harm. So, the ancient Egyptians were on exactly the same ancestralism that traditional African religions were about. Are we understanding this? Yeah? All right, now, living people would even write letters to the dead, and there'd be a particular way of laying it out. They would ask for help with sickness, persecution, or troubles. The letters would address the dead person, greet the deceased, praise the deceased, encouraging them to help the living, describe the problem, and appeal to the deceased to intervene. This is straight up ancestralism. Now, how comes you all did ancient Egypt in primary school? Because it's on the national curriculum. They never taught you that the ancient Egyptians were ancestralists, did they? They taught you about mummies, but they didn't tell you they were ancestralists because they didn't want you to see that that is what African cultures across the board do. Get it? All right, now, the importance of heka. Now, what does this word mean? Some people say it means magic. Others say that it means powers. According to Professor Taylor, the deities possessed heka. Heka was accessible to priests, ordinary people, and ancestors. And it could also be used by the deities in the afterlife. Some people think heka means power. And according to David Rankin, an authority on magic, he says, It is impossible to practice Egyptian magic without incorporating the symbols and worship of the gods. Therefore, one discussion our community needs to have is what are the similarities and differences between prayer, between spells, between science. Notice I put science in inverted commas. You all know what I'm talking about. And magic. What's the difference? Now, a lot of us have been led to believe any mention of spells, any mention of science, any mention of magic is doppy worship, and you want to leave the room immediately. What's the difference between these and prayer? Do you see? Do you see how we've been taught to hate what our ancestors used to do? Now, the Book of the Dead contains Heka. And written and spoken words 
were believed by the ancient Egyptians to have power in themselves. So they called their writing Medu Neta. Neta is God. Medu, words. Words of God. God's words. Does that make sense? The Greeks translated it as hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, the hiero part of it means sacred. God's. Glyphics, writings. Sacred writings. Now, pronouncing the name of something was thought to bring it into existence just as when, according to the ancient belief system, when Ptah conceived of things in his mind and then brought them into existence by uttering their names. And it's interesting to compare this idea with those in later African cultures. It's also important to compare this idea with the success philosophies such as Napoleon Hill. Do you all know Napoleon Hill? Think and grow rich. He says it's very important that if you want to be successful, you have to think successful. You can't let negative thinking enter your mind because you don't want to manifest negative thinking. Does that make sense? And the Egyptians were the pioneers of this. They believed that by speaking things, you bring it into existence. That, by the way, is why black people cannot be calling each other the N-word. That, by the way, is why we cannot be calling women the B-word. Does that make sense? Because all we're doing is invoking these things and bring them into existence. Now, is this why, during enslavement, Europeans and Arabs suppressed our names? Is that why they did it? Because they knew that if they got rid of African names and replaced them with European or Arab names, those names don't have power. Does that make sense? Is this why, in modern African culture, People only reveal parts of their names to others and keep the rest of it secret. Is that why we do that? Hmm. An example, the Book of the Dead, there's a bit in it where an individual encounters negative forces. And one of the things you should say, according to the Book of the Dead, is, I know you and I know your names before getting that evil spirit to depart. Does that make sense? Another way in which the texts give power is for the dead speaker to identify themselves with one of the deities, deities such as Osiris, Horus, Ra, and Atum. Chapter 43 of the Book of the Dead, for example, says, I am put together just and young, for I indeed am Osiris, the Lord of Eternity. That's you associating yourself with being Osiris and then having the power that comes with it. The idea of providing the dead with texts that provided them with Heka began with the pyramid texts and then this evolved with the coffin texts and then ultimately this evolved into the Book of the Dead, the Peret M. Heru, the coming forth by day. Do you get it? And guess what? It's stretch time. All right, stretch means everyone needs to get up. If I don't do this, everyone's going to be sleeping in it, so everyone needs to get up. If someone has sat down, feel free to tickle that person. Okay, so feel free to tickle. Okay, so it's like this. So it's like this. Right, good. It's like this. Stretch in this way. Good. It's like this. Stretch in this way. It's to the back like this. Good. It's to the front like this. And then rub again. All right, thanks a lot. All right, so let me get to the meat of today's session. How do we use the Book of the Dead? The Book of the Dead has chapter headings in red ink, body text in black ink, and special words are emphasized in red or white ink. Right, can you see here we've got black ink, and can you see the red ink? Does that make sense? Now, which other holy books have got texts in black ink and significant parts in red ink? Gosh. All right, now when written on walls or coffins, the utterances were sometimes written in blue. Now, utterances, for them to work, there were instructions given about the specifics, the right time of day for the actions to be carried out. For example, chapter 144 in the Book of the Dead states, 
to be recited and erased item by item after reciting these directions four hours of the day having passed and taking great care as to the position of the sun in the sky so that's telling you how to practice it sometimes the spells involve the transfer of power to a particular object such as an amulet or a model animal at a word of command these animals were supposed to come to life now the question now is of what use were these utterances spells or prayers in everyday life chapter 17 says if a man speaks this spell when he is in a state of purity it means going forth after death into the day and assuming whatever shape he desires as for anyone who shall read it daily for his own benefit, it means being hail on earth. Hail means mighty. He shall come forth from every fire and nothing evil shall reach him. Chapter 71 in the Book of the Dead says, As for him who shall recite this spell, it means prosperity on earth with Ra and a goodly burial with Osiris. Now compare that with Napoleon Hill. Remember the guy that wrote Think and Grow Rich? Has anyone ever read that book, by the way, Think and Grow Rich? Yeah. Yes? Now, if you've ever read that book, do you notice the last chapter where he calls it, he's going, he's at uh, a sleep a night, he's at, um, at sleep, he's, you know, he's sleeping at night and he's conjuring up what he calls uh, 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 the different... Um, what do they call them? Entrepreneurs. He's tried to invoke. Does that make sense? And he calls them a kind of um, uh, sitting around a table. You remember that scene? Yeah. Yes? Now you can tell who's read the Book of the Dead from who hasn't because you'll remember that. And Napoleon Hill doesn't explain what he's doing, but he's calling up ancestors. Does that make sense? And he's able to ask those ancestors very specific information to help him succeed as a businessman. Yes? So if anyone doubts this, check the Book of the Dead, read the last chapter, and be surprised that this is what a European is writing. And then you then check where Napoleon Hill got it from. He got it from us. But that's a whole other story. Okay, so what's in the Book of the Dead? There's an introductory adoration scene. Chapter 1 spoke of the dead person's arrival in Chapter 17 has the dead person identifying with the deity Atum. These were chapters, excuse me, there were chapters for the dead person to secure their essential abilities to negotiate the netherworld. Some chapters refer to the heart. Others call for protection against dangerous animals. There are chapters on providing water in the necropolis for the benefit of the dead person. There are chapters that allow the dead person to transform into a bar, the deity Patar, a crocodile, a snake, etc. Chapter 89 concerns the bar regularly reuniting with the corpse at night. There are chapters concerning the ferry boat in the journey through the netherworld. There are chapters concerning the journey of the dead in the boat of Ra. There are chapters concerning the gates and their demon-like guardians. There are chapters concerning knowledge of the mysterious region, such as the 14 mounds of the netherworld. Chapter 125 is the judgment scene before Osiris. And the British Museum says, this spell seems to form the core of each role. Which spell, please? Chapter 125. Does that make sense? Who says chapter 125 is the core? Right, so you now need, so you're now asking yourself the right question. What's chapter 125? Yeah, we come into it. That's cool, we coming. But you now know to look out for that, yes? Because you've been told chapter 125 is what? It's the core, yes? Who said so? A war. <laughs> right, in the duat or the mysteries of a mentor, let me explain what's going on here. The the person has died. Herodotus says, In the case of people in whose houses there perishes a man of some consequence, all the females from these houses smear their heads with dust, and sometimes also the face. And then they leave the corpse 
in the house and themselves wander through the town, beat their breasts with garments girt up, revealing their breasts, and with them all his female relatives. And the males beat their breasts separately, these two with their garments girt up. When they have done this, so do they carry forth the corpse to be mummified. All right, so the, realm, the dead now are now in the realm of the duat. The duat now is the netherworld, the underworld. Does that make sense? Yeah? Now, you could look at it as the netherworld. You could look at it as the underworld. You could also look at it as inside the body of the goddess Newt. You know the story about Newt? She swallows the sun at night and then gives birth to it the following morning. Yeah? So in other words, the action could be taking place there for all we know. And the duat was depicted in art with land, fields, rivers, lakes, pathways, caverns, living and living creatures, emphasizing the local African landscape. It also contained turquoise trees, iron walls, and fire lakes, emphasizing weirdness, strangeness. There were also buildings with gates and openings. And some of these places, such as the Fire Lakes, are definitely set in the Central African Great Lakes region. Did you know this? Aren't you glad you're here? All right, now, the dead person, also known as the Manes. Manes is the Greek name for it. You could imagine now, you're, you're the dead person, you're the Manes, and you're traveling through the netherworld on foot or by boat. And you're traveling to do... Um, Two things, either you're trying to meet Ra or you're trying to enter the kingdom of Osiris. Does that make sense? So you are now on an adventure story to get to the kingdom of Osiris or to travel in the boat of Ra. Does that make sense? And all you have with you is your papyrus roll. And you're using Heka, which is power, to open pathways and banish darkness. So you're making your voyage, and Massey, one of the great scholars who writes on ancient Africa, pictures the Manes as a pilgrim holding on to their Book of the Dead scroll as they journey through a mentor. Holding on to the roll is specifically mentioned in chapter 15 of the Book of the Dead. To get to these locations, the dead person must negotiate the challenges faced by the gates, the challenges faced by the mounds, and the challenges faced by the caverns. He must also avoid the punishments reserved for the unrighteous. So negotiating the gates. Can you see you've got three gates on the bottom tier and two on the top? Right? Can you also see that the gates have guardians with these horrible shaped knives? And you've got to get past those people. Does that make sense? So how do you get past them? You're going to use Heka. Now the gates themselves... Every one of them has its keeper, its guard, and its announcer. All three must be negotiated. And how you get through the gates is you need to say the right thing from the Book of the Dead, chapter 144. Make way for me, for I know you, I know your name, and I know the name of the God who guards you, mistress of darkness. Its height cannot be known from its breadth, and its extent in space cannot be discovered. Snakes are on it, of which the number is not known. It was fashioned before the inert one is your name. He who was joined together is the name of her doorkeeper. Other guards that you have to get past have such pleasant names as Who hacks up the human dead? Who dances in blood? Sharp of knife against the talker. You can work it out. Sharp of knife against the talker. That's people that run up their mouths, politicians, yeah, that's them, they get it? All right, now the same thing existed in the world of the living. Can you see that that is an Egyptian temple? Right, can you see the amount of gates and passageways you need to get through? Right, then let me read what Professor Taylor, you know the person that curated the exhibition? Let me read what he says. The content of these spells brings to mind the layout of Egyptian temples. The temple sanctuary in which the god dwelt was surrounded by numerous walls pierced with gateways, as may still be seen at Karnak, and each gateway was guarded by an attendant. 
The priests, in order to enter and perform their duties in the temples, had to pass an initiation involved in the demonstration of their purity and special knowledge. The texts for some of these procedures survive and display close affinities with passages from the Book of the Dead. Now, here's the thing. What does that sound like to you? You're entering a temple, you've got to say something special to get through the door. You get through that door, you've got to say something special to get through the next door. What does it sound like? Freemasonry. So when Dr. Ben talks about the African origin of Freemasonry, it's not gas. There's your proof. Does that make sense? So what have we seen so far in this presentation? Count Dracula is ancient Egyptian. Did we just see that? Yes. The story of a deity being tied up in very tight clothing, loosens those clothing and then comes back to life. That's Christianity. We've already seen that. Now we're seeing masonry. Are we feeling this? Now, another thing that you have to get past in your journey through the netherworld is to negotiate the mounds. And that's what they look like in the Book of the Dead. And the mounds are important for two reasons. Firstly, they existed in the Egyptian landscape. And secondly, they represented the deity Ptah, emerging from the watery abyss of noon in the creation story. So you've got to get over these mountains. So how do you do it? Chapter 149 says, the fourth mount, green, the deceased says, so this is what you have to say. As far, excuse me, as for the chief of the mysterious mount, as for the very high mountain, which is in the realm of the dead, in which the sky sets, it is 300 rods long by 150 rods wide. A snake is on it called Castor of Knives, and it is 70 cubits when it glides. It lives by decapitating the spirits of the dead in the realm of the dead. I rise up against you, the snake, so that navigation may be carried out aright. I have seen the way to you, and I will gather myself together against you, for I am the male. Cover your head, for I am hail, hail. Hail means mighty. I am one mighty of magic, and my eyes have caused me to benefit therefrom. So that's what you're supposed to say. Does that make sense? The dead person will also have to negotiate caverns, caves. Each cavern was occupied by one or more divine beings. The dead person also has to know about other beings that existed in the netherworld. These were the souls of the east, the souls of the west, the souls of the cities of Heliopolis, Hermopolis, Neken and Pei. You need to know how to get past those other divine beings. Heka was used to protect the Manes in other ways. Can you see that, that, that strip of hieroglyphics? That was rolled up and was worn around your neck. Let me explain that. Chapter 27 speaks of the divine power who sees his heart and can therefore turn your heart against you in the judgment scene. It was important to protect the car just in case the relative did not supply the correct offerings. Chapter 105 freed the dead person from dependence on their relatives and priests if they wore the correct papyrus around their necks. Professor Taylor says, the illusion is to the practice of wearing around the neck a small rod of papyrus inscribed with a protective text. Do you get that? So what we used to do in ancient Egyptian times, the people used to wear papyrus uh, inscribed with sacred writings around their necks. Does that make sense? And guess what? In medieval Africa, we used to do the same thing. Does anyone know who this is? His, no, his name is Job Ben Solomon. That's the English name. Ayuba um, Giallo is his African name. Does that make sense? Yeah. And can you see what he's got around his neck? What is it? It's a Quran. So in other words, here, even though he's doing it with a later religion, that's the same practice that our ancestors would have done with the earlier religion. Do you get it? Yeah? All right, there's his name, Ayuba Suleiman Giallo. And 1733 is when that painting was made. Now, becoming an Ak, the blessed dead. Okay, chapter 61 protected the bar from being taken from its owner. Chapters 91, 92 and 188 protected the shut or shadow. 
If all these elements of the self were successfully reunited, that person became an effective spirit or an ark. You can also be transformed in other ways. Chapters 76 to 88 were transformation spells, allowing the manies to become a falcon, a heron, a swallow, a snake, a crocodile, a lotus flower or any form he wishes. These forms were important in the dead person moving from the netherworld to the realm of the living. Now what does that sound like to you, being able to transform into a falcon, a heron, a swallow, a snake, etc? Therefore, all of these beasties are sacred because they're someone's soul. Which religion is that, please? Hinduism. See, you know, when people were putting Hinduism together, they were rinsing this stuff out. Yes? Everybody be teething from this text. Everybody. Another set of challenges were dangerous animals. Can you see the person with a... Uh, 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 a spear in their hand, spearing the apep demon. Can you see that? Yes? And there's three examples of it up there. And one of these beasties was apep, the great enemy of Ra. Chapter 31 says against the crocodile, Get back, retreat. Get back, you dangerous one. Do not come against me. Do not live by my magic. May I not have to tell this name of yours to the great God who sent you. Many believe that Apep battles nightly against Ra to stop Ra rising on the eastern horizon. Now, the imagery of the person spearing that beastie, what does that look like to you? It's St. George. It's St. George and the dragon. In fact, that is the original of St. George and the dragon. Are we feeling this? Did I tell you that everyone be teething from this? Yeah? Now, people want to run up their mouths. Look at Ethiopian examples of St. George and the Dragon and tell me if it doesn't look like that. Yet another form of danger to avoid was punishment of the unjustified. Many of these punishments were at the command of Osiris. These involved avoiding slaughter, putrefaction, having a rightful place taken, dying a second death, Traps such as the fishing net and the world turning upside down. This last form of danger would involve, among other things, your digestive system working the wrong way round, and thus the victim drank urine and ate feces. And you need to be protected from that. Do you get it? Now, the fishing net. Can you see I've got there the opposite of Christianity? With Christianity, you want to be caught in the fishing net. Does that make sense? Because in Christianity... Jesus and his disciples are fishermen trying to catch you in the fishing net. Can you see that what they did was take the story and turn it the other way around? Because in the original, you don't want to be caught in the fishing net. Because that's one of the traps in the netherworld. Do you see? Yeah? There was also the danger of drinking burning water and your supply of air failing. And in all of these cases, there were utterances that would protect the dead individual from these consequences. Right, let's sum it up. Gerald Massey and John Taylor show a remarkably similar picture to what's going on in the duat, in the netherworld, in the underworld. There were gates, mounds, caverns, and their fearsome guardians. There were other spiritual beings, turquoise trees, iron walls, fire lakes, traps, and the world working upside down. There were evil-minded divine beings and evil-minded serpents. Against this, the pilgrim, armed with his papyrus roll, armed with his divine protection, armed with his secrets, rituals, and words of power, is going up to fight against this. Now, what does all that sound like to you? Every adventure story ever written. Not true. Every adventure story ever written. Every horror story ever written. I was just chewing it, chewing it over on the way here. Old head here. do you remember the film, uh, Officer and a Gentleman? Anyone remember that? Yeah. Young heads are here are wondering, what the hell was that? <laughs> Even the Officer and a Gentleman is ripped off from this. And I'm going to show it to you. Officer and a Gentleman, what you have is... You have a young white boy 
wants to join the Marines. And then there's a black guy, Lou Gossett Jr., who's his sergeant, drill sergeant. And the drill sergeant makes it so difficult for him, tests him, tests him, puts obstacles in his way, puts obstacles in his way. And the young um, uh, guy trying to join the Marines has to prove his righteousness, has to prove he can withstand all of that. Does that make sense? So in Officer and a Gentleman, the white guy trying to become a Marine, he's the Mainies. And then Lou Gossett Jr. is Osiris, the person who you've got to prove your righteousness to. Do you get it? Yeah? And according to Napoleon Hill, he calls this the principle of persistence. You're about to cut me off, in it? I've, I've got five minutes, okay? okay? I think I can finish this. All right, stretch time. Everyone needs to get up. All right, so just do this. All right. Okay, just sit down because I, I can't waste the time. <laughs> All right, somebody asked me a question about the name, the, a particular chapter. What was the chapter? This is what 125 is. 125 is the greatest challenge is your judgment. Does that make sense? And the judgment scene, what you have is, let me show you. This is the way to act in the hall of the tomb of arts. A man says this speech when he is pure, clean, dressed in fresh clothes, shod in white sandals, painted with eye paint, anointed with the finest oil or myrrh. To enter the hall, the individual had to answer questions posed by the divine beings on who he is and the mysteries of Osiris. Following this, he's invited to enter. And then you have Osiris sitting in judgment, and in some versions, you've got 12 judges. In other versions, you've got 42 judges. Does that make sense? And then what you have to do is you have to address Osiris. Can you see Osiris is, is wearing that hat that we associate with the Pope? And he's got the shepherd's crook. And then address to Osiris. Praise to thee, thou great God, thou Lord of the true truths. I come to thee and bring thee truth and chase away wrongdoing. I have committed no sins against mankind. I have done that I have not done that which the gods abhor. I have not made man evil in the eyes of his superior. I have not caused to hunger. I have not caused to weep. I have done no murder. I have commanded uh, I have not commanded to murder. I have not occasioned grief. Is this sounding familiar? Right. And then you address the 42 judges. You speak to the first judge and say, O fast rider who came forth from Heliopolis, I have done no falsehood. We've been told this is the core of the thing. Yes? I have done no falsehood. Second judge, I have not robbed. Third judge, I have not stolen. Fourth judge, I have not killed men. We've been told this is the core, right? What's this sounding like to you? Next judge, I have not stolen the God's offerings. Next judge, I have not told lies. Ten Commandments, right? And we've been told by who? British Museum. British Museum that this is the core. And there's 36 others, right? So chapter 125 in, 100, um, in everyday life, that chapter could be summed up as, I, ha I gave bread to the hungry and clothes to the naked. I gave a passage in my own boat to those who could not cross. I was a father to the orphan, a husband to the widow, a protection from the wind to the shivering. I am one who spake what was good and related what was good. I acquired my possessions in a just manner. And then if you look in Christianity, you know they ripped a bit of that off. The bit about uh, giving bread to the hungry and clothes to the naked. They didn't teeth the rest of it though. But they, they, they lifted bits. All right, now, following this was the weighing of the heart. And if things went well, can you see again, that judgment scene is Christianity. And if things went well, I have judged the heart of the deceased and his soul, his soul stands as a witness for him. His deeds are righteous. Another outcome is the person then says, here I am in your presence, O Lord of the West. There is no wrongdoing in my body. I have not wittingly told lies. There has been no second fault. Grant that I may be like the favoured ones. 
And then outcome two is that. You get nyam up to use the technical and scholarly terminology, yes? Right, let me show you something else in the Book of the Dead. Can you see that that attitude the person has like this? Does that make sense? Same person now, their attitude is that. What's that? Islam, yes? Can you see? Straight. So here's the point. Now if you're successful, you became uh, what's known as the Ma'at Keru. If you're successful. Once vindicated, you then travel the sacred boat with Ra, or you could join the Elysian fields. Does that make sense? All right, so what have we learned about Egyptian of life, spirituality, and death? We've learned the most important things here. Egyptian spirituality is the basis of modern psychology. Yes? We've talked about the Book of the Dead, how it was used, and some people say it's magic, some people say it's spells, but I've said you can't distinguish magic, spells, and prayer. It's the same thing. Does that make sense? It's prayer if you agree with it, and it's magic if you disagree with it. Does that make sense? We've talked about in the duat, or the mysteries of a mentor, and we've seen that the story in the mysteries of a mentor is every adventure story ever written. And we've even spotted specific ones like Dracula. In the Hall of the Two Ma'ats, which is the core of the belief system, says the British Museum, is the original of what was the Ten Commandments. All right, so the Book of the Dead, every adventure story ever written. These are all the things that's there. Jason the Golden Fleece, Harry Potter, Count Dracula, Indiana Jones, St. George and the Dragon, The Resurrection, Islam, the Ten Commandments, Judaism, the afterlife, Pilgrim's Progress, Reincarnation, the Science of the Mind, the Mitre and the Shepherd's Crook, Backgammon, Harry, you follow me? Etc. You want to know more? There's a children's book that I've written called Black History Matters, going for £13. Blacks and Religion, Volume 1, that's going for £10. And I think I've got a copy of the Black Science book. Thank you very much. <laughs>